last week at this time I would have said hola um, or piña colada or whatever time of day it was. So I want to welcome all of you to the Business and Leaders Luncheon. You can go ahead and have a seat. Yeah, we're not quite ready for you. I've got probably 35 minutes of talking to do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So my name is Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Best Darn Chamber in the Pacific Northwest. And it was a joy to be out of town and be on vacation, but it was more of a joy to get to come home. And I'll tell you a little bit about my trip in just a minute. Um, I want to thank our presenting sponsors. I want to welcome back Portland General Electric. They renewed their contract to be a sponsor of the Business and Leaders Luncheon. And we're welcoming a new presenting sponsor today, and that is Columbia Bank. So I'm hoping that Robin Dodge Little gets to show up. Dean will be a little bit late from Portland General Electric, so he'll be here soon. Our continuing stakeholder sponsor is Gresham Barlow School District. And I'm hoping that they come today because school districts will be impacted by what the conversation is um, forthcoming. And Metro East Community Media. Keith, are you awake? There you go. Hi, Keith. Thank you very much. Our replay schedules are... Um, on the desk as you go out, be sure and get a replay schedule so that you could share the information with your friends or listen to it again with Metro East Community Media. They are a sponsor of this event. Um, Holly, will you go out and get Shelly for just a second? Thank you. I want to recognize elected officials that are in the audience today and we have Metro Council Shirley Craddock with us today. Thank you very much Councilor Craddock for taking the time to come here and on the phone is our birthday girl <laughs> Shelly Wright. Happy birthday Shelly. There you go. So um, I it, actually her birthday was yesterday her birthday is actually today and um, we appreciate you working on your birthday and being with us here so thank you very much okay um, it's not like the state of the union where everybody starts to sing happy birthday to whoever I don't know if you watched that but I thought that was interesting at the state of the union address they all stopped and sang happy birthday to a 97 year old gentleman that was there today that day recognize our board members that are here today Dean Funk is on his way Dr. Scari from Manhood Community College is on his way and we have Warner Allen who I will introduce again in just a minute Warner Allen is with Warren Allen LL P C D Q okay we don't have to go through that and I want to thank Persimmon. Persimmon did a wonderful job with the luncheon today and the not only the food but also how the the place looks. Lane and Jeffrey if you have a chance talk to them about how wonderful it was. So I have a little bit of a tan because I got to take a vacation and we vacation in Roatan. It's our ninth trip to Roatan. Roatan is an island in Honduras and it's the coral reef that is the Belize coral reef and when you stay in Belize you have to get in a boat and go out of the bay 10 minutes to where the coral reef is. That same coral reef is in Roatan only it's from here to the front door of this building. You walk and you're right in the coral reef and you're among rays and eels and grouper and all kinds of fish etc. It's a wonderful place and the way we found it is um, a, I, my husband and I own a garden center and a garden center owner in Eugene is an investor in this and I helped him out with a computer issue and he said you know you and your husband should go to and stay in my place in Roatan. So I said, well, I don't know if we could afford it. He says, well, just for the cost of cleaning the room, we'll let you stay in our place. So the first year we went to Roatan, we were in a four bedroom, five deck, huge place in this resort on the beach for $30 a night. I was hooked. Doesn't cost us, we're down to one room now and all that kind of stuff. But he, is, he was one of four investors from Eugene that bought the property in Roatan and built this five-star resort. It's called Infinity Bay. 
So when I go to Roatan every year, I am shopping local because I'm supporting these investors from Eugene. But every year, and it's gotten better since we first started going nine years ago, every year we get a power issue. And I've shared this story this morning already. The power down there, the electric power down there, is owned by an individual, not by the state, not by the government, not by a group. It's owned by an individual. And when he was mad about something, he just turned the power off. Somebody didn't pay, he got mad at his neighbor, whatever it ca the case was, he just to turn the power off. Well, every year we're down there for the Super Bowl, and every year he turns the power off during the Super Bowl halftime. I don't know what he has against the Super Bowl halftime, but every year the power is turned off. So at Infinity, where we stay, they have a generator. But this year, they weren't sure they wanted to use the generator for all of the halftime. So I'm going to have to find out from you if the halftime was worth. The game was a little iffy because the score was so low. And Seattle wasn't there. But anyway, Rotan is wonderful. I'm shopping local. And utilities, when they're owned by individuals, are at the whim. This particular t utility who's the guest today has a different approach on how they are helping us all appreciate natural gas and what, what's here. So to introduce our speaker today, I want to introduce a recycled chair of the Government Affairs Council. The Government Affairs Council was chaired by Warner Allen and Brian Lessler because of some health issues and business issues said, I think we should have a new chair. And so we've recycled Warner Allen to be the chair of the Government Affairs <laughs> Committee. So Warner, I'd like you to come up and introduce our speaker for the day. Well, recycling is a you know, it's an important um, activity that we all engage in, so I, I embrace that opportunity. Um, our speaker today is Kimberly Heiting, uh, who is Northwest Natural's Senior Vice President for Operations and the Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, Ms. Heiting received her Bachelor's of Arts in Communication at the University of Iowa and a Master's of Science in Communication at Northwestern University in Illinois. So it's no wonder that she has held very important communication positions for the past decade at Northwest Natural. In order to be good at communication, you need to know the facts, supposedly, um, which is important, and to share, and especially how to share, that information. She is the spokesperson in so many ways for who Northwest Natural is and what they are doing. Kimberly currently serves as president of the Northwest Gas Association Board, also as a member of the Operations and Sustainable Growth Committees of the American Gas Association. Low carbon pathway, which is our topic today, perhaps not what most of us would want to talk about with our dinner guests, but definitely very important information for us as business leaders. So please join me in welcoming Kimberly to our stage. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And again, thanks for allowing me an opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing at Northwest Natural. A lot of discussion about carbon and carbon policy and climate change. And so I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, I've gotten a little instruction here, and I'll do my best uh, uh, to do this correctly. So I'm going to start just a couple of context setting slides about who we are as a company. And, and hopefully, uh, this won't come as any surprise to you. But we actually just had a birthday. We turned 160 years old. We're actually older than the state of Oregon itself. And we are today the largest standalone gas utility in the Northwest, serving about 2 million people in our service territory. And we operate one of the newest, most modern distribution systems in the country. It's a fact that we're not only really proud of, but it's very relevant to the um, conversation about climate. And I'll talk about that in a moment. We have about 1,200 employees that live and work in the communities we serve, of course, including here. And uh, we have a very strong customer service ethic. Uh, we, this year, uh, were rated uh, number one in the West in the J.D. Power Residential Satisfaction Survey for the sixth consecutive year, and number one for business. 
And I mentioned that, not to brag, we're really proud of it, but uh, really to, it demonstrates the service ethos we have as a company. We are a fuel of choice. We take that very seriously. We know we have to do better and constantly being improving. A little closer to home, we serve about 50,000 Gresham area customers, uh, providing 1.7 million in franchise fees, and we pay about $3 million uh, in, to Mountain Loma County for, prop, for taxes. We donate about a million dollars to local communities through our shareholder funding program, uh, supporting a variety of nonprofits and also uh, supporting local uh, events through sponsor sponsorships and in-kind contributions with our tents. And again, I, I start here because as a 160-year-old company, you have to do a few things right to stay independent and to stay locally owned. Number one, you've got to recognize as a utility we're only going to be as successful as the business and the residents that we serve. And then number two probably is, is you're going to have to evolve your business. Uh, we started out, uh, believe it or not, as a lighting company in the 1860s. We lit the streets of Portland, uh, and then we evolved over time into obviously serving homes and businesses with natural gas. Um, and most recently, I, I would say we've been leading the industry on climate and, and some work around our low carbon initiative, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, one of the firsts for the industry, we offer a carbon offset product. Uh, this is called Smart Energy, and it basically is a partnership that we've formed with uh, farmers, local farmers, where we're developing biogas on their farms, which has a big climate benefit. Uh, and, uh, and the next step that we're taking, and I'm going to talk to you about it today, is putting that biogas through new technology that cleans it up and allows us to put it on our pipeline system. Uh, and that's called renewable natural gas. So ev evolving the business is critical, and we see that. A couple of years ago, uh, as a company, we undertook a comprehensive strategic planning effort. Many, I'm sure, of your businesses or organizations periodically do, do that. At the center for us was carbon policy, because we know uh, climate change, there is a climate imperative. And our state is going to be acting. We have very aggressive greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, both in Oregon and in Washington. So where do we fit in as a company? Where does natural gas fit in? And that was really the challenge that we set out to really dive into the analytics. So before you can know where you're going, you have to know where you're at. And this slide gives you our starting point in Oregon. Uh, the pie graph represents all the different slivers of emissions from all of the different energy sectors in the state of Oregon. And it may not be very easy to read. I think there's a version of it at your tables on the back side if that's easier to read. But basically you have um, the blue sliver represents what we call direct use natural gas. So one of the important things to know is there's two different ways that natural gas gets used in the state of Oregon. Direct use is when a company like Northwest Natural, Avista or Cascade, deliver the product directly into homes and businesses and you use it through equipment. The other way is when electric utilities purchase gas from, from marketers or producers, not from Northwest Natural, and they use natural gas for power generation. So those are the two different ways we use natural gas in Oregon. About half of the gas we use in Oregon is through direct use, and the other half is for power generation. So when you think about our starting point as a company, 5% of the state's emissions are associated with the use of natural gas by our sales customers. So that's residential and commercial customers. What do we get for that 5%? Well, I would argue we get an awful lot. Northwest Natural heats 74% of the residential square footage in our service area. We actually provide more energy in Oregon than any other utility. And on that cold, dark winter morning, our residential space and water heat customers are getting about 90% of their home's energy needs met by the gas system. So we step back and we say, OK, well, that's a pretty efficient system to start with. But the reality is we can't be done. Because if our state is to meet its aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals, every sliver of that pie over time is going to have to shrink. And we understand that. Which is why we established a voluntary carbon savings goal 
of a 30% savings by 2035 from that 2015 emissions baseline. So think about, I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, but think about that 5%. Our goal is to shrink that by another 30% by 2035. How are we going to do that? Well, as a gas utility, we have to look up and down the value chain. So if we look up the value chain and we start with decarbonizing our product, so we want to lower the carbon intensity of what is going through our pipeline. And a lot of people get this frame of reference on the electric side. So if you think about that paradigm, you're starting with coal for power generation, you're integrating more uh, natural gas for power generation, and then you're relying more and more on renewable energy. You're trying to develop more and more renewable energy. And so you're lowering the carbon intensity over time of the electric grid. People kind of get that concept. What they don't understand is you can do the same thing with the natural gas pipeline system. You start with conventional natural gas, which by the way is a cleaner starting point, so we kind of have a, a nice advantage there. And then you integrate in renewable natural gas. And that is taking organic waste streams that would otherwise emit methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas when left emitted to the atmosphere. You capture it, you put that in cleanup equipment, and you put it into the pipeline system. That has a carbon benefit very similar to wind and solar energy. The next step, so you've got conventional gas to renewable gas. The next step is hydrogen. You, there is a technology that uh, is in play today, primarily in Europe, but a little bit here in the States and in Canada, where they're taking excess wind and solar energy and they're basically putting it through an electrolysis process and creating hydrogen. So basically you're, you're storing renewable energy through hydrogen and integrating that into the pipeline system. A lot to take in, but it's just to give you the frame of res reference that you can decarbonize the gas grid or the gas system in the same way that you can on the electric side. And that's really what we're trying to get across in our first bucket of savings. The second bucket of savings is really working with our customers. And at the center of this opportunity is energy efficiency. It is the cheapest, fastest way to reduce emissions. And, there, and we've proven uh, that we can get a whole lot of value there. Back in 1970, I think we had half the customers that we do today, or even less than that. And let's, if I were to give you a graph, here would be our emissions from the gas sector. And we might have a few appliances in the home. Well, since 1970 to today, we have a lot more customers, a lot more gas appliances in the home. But on a per customer basis, our customers have cut their energy use in half. And that means they've cut their emissions in half. And so energy efficiency is a very powerful tool. It's not as exciting as some of the other things we're going to talk about today, but it, it really is at the center of our, of our savings goal. Uh, there's also other technology that uh, the industry is working on where you're combining solar panels with gas water heating or you're looking at gas heat pumps. So there's uh, lots of other technologies that we're working on that will help us in this bucket. And then finally, we want to be able to displace diesel in the heavy duty transportation market. If you recall that pie graph I showed you, transportation is the biggest wedge and it's growing. And we've got to do something about it if we're going to meet our goals. And heavy duty transportation is a big chunk of that. Not only do you have a carbon savings benefit when you move from diesel to compressed natural gas, about a 20% carbon savings benefit, you get a huge air quality and air particulate benefit. When you move from conventional gas to renewable gas in transportation, you get an 80% carbon reduction benefit. So lots of opportunity here. So those are our buckets. That's what we as a company are focused on going after. I mentioned renewable natural gas because it's a really important component of our strategy. And again, in, in essence, it's taking organic materials that would otherwise be emitting methane, 
So think about wastewater treatment plants, uh, manure on the farm floor, uh, food waste, woody waste on the, far, uh, on the forest floor. You're capturing all of that waste that would otherwise emit greenhouse gases. You're putting it through cleanup equipment, and you're creating an interchangeable product with natural gas that, w that we serve you today. And it has a very significant carbon savings benefit, about 80%. So that's the concept, but we thought it would be um, better to show you a video because uh, I think it gives you a little bit more um, of a context about this. And then I'll talk a, a bit about some of the projects that we're working on, renewable natural gas projects. So we're going to see if this works. This will be exciting if it does. Oregon's population continues to grow. And with that growth comes waste. From cows, from food, and from all of us. Waste that creates greenhouse gases that can harm our atmosphere. But now those gases can be captured and converted into renewable natural gas. So there will be less harmful emissions in the air and more clean burning energy where we need it. Join us in finding more ways to do less. Northwest Natural, less we can. Well, renewable natural gas is kind of a new concept for folks. It comes from all different kinds of waste. It comes from food waste that's gathered up from the curb. It comes from uh, farm waste, think cow manure. It comes from human waste that we flush to the wastewater treatment plant. All of that waste can be turned into renewable natural gas. About 20% of the warming we've experienced to date has come from human-caused methane. So focusing on gases like methane is the most immediate thing that needs to be done in order to mitigate catastrophic climate change. How we use and dispose of resources has a huge impact on the environment. It's about how we consume goods. It means working together through partnerships and different agencies, different stakeholders. Right now we're capturing about 27,000 tons of food waste from businesses that are voluntarily source separating their food waste. Ultimately, if the natural gas is being made into vehicle fuel, not only am I composting my food waste, I'm fueling my vehicle um, with food waste. The Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant treats on average about 60 million gallons per day of the city's wastewater. From that wastewater, we produce about 1.6 million cubic feet of biogas that we plan on converting to renewable natural gas. I'm mostly working with dairy manure. Uh, I tell my friends we flush it into a big concrete tank, uh, capture the gas that comes out of it to make electricity, but can go into a pipeline or into a vehicle too. I'm proud of Northwest Natural. There's really an opportunity to change what's in the pipeline to have these huge climate benefits. Being able to tell that exciting story that this is going to be used to create renewable natural gas, which then can be used to heat your home or potentially to fuel your vehicle, that can help motivate people to make the change and also feel like they're having a positive impact, that it matters. Right. So hopefully that gave you a little bit more context about what we're focused on uh, and, and the Oregon Department of Ener Energy last year, I mean one of the questions we get when we talk about renewable natural gas is, well, okay, that sounds great, but how much is there? You know, how, how big is this opportunity? So the legislature um, asked uh, Odo to go out and really create the technical potential for renewable natural gas in Oregon, and they did that work, and they released a study last year that showed there is an, enough waste streams in Oregon with our population growth, which, by the way, will continue. To, if we converted all of those waste streams into renewable natural gas, it equates to the same amount of energy that we currently use to, to serve all of the residential customers in our state. So that is a huge opportunity. And we're really excited about it. We're seeing a lot of momentum. I'll give you a little bit of a flavor. You, you saw the uh, folks that we've been working with on, um, from the city of Portland on their wastewater treatment plant. It's expected to go online later this year. They're calling it their single largest climate action uh, project to date. It will um, basically displace 1.34 million gallons of diesel annually. Uh, it also equates to, if you were going to equate this amount of energy, it could serve 6,000 homes 
their heating load annually each year. So one project having that kind of benefit, we're incredibly excited about it. We have a couple of other projects we're working on already. The City of Eugene's Wastewater Treatment Plant um, is pursuing this path, along with a, a private, uh, large private developer who's under NDA and I can't talk about, but I can tell you that all three of those projects together will have about a 2% throughput value of, of when you compare our current throughput of our sales customers. So, well, what does that mean? It means that um, we're making significant progress on our goal in, in the few years that we've been um, working on this path. And I mention that because we're incredibly excited. I mean, we all know we've been working on wind and solar energy for a couple of decades. So we need to really put our shoulder to this. This is um, not only a new renewable energy source that's a local source, but it's also a problem that is a growing problem. It's waste. So great opportunities there. I mentioned power to gas. This is one that I get uh, really excited about. It's a little bit further out there. This is a cutting edge uh, technology. There's about, I would say, 40 projects worldwide, primarily in, in Europe. To be honest with you, Europeans are ahead of us here, uh, but also Canada, and there's a couple are um, uh, in California, a couple of demonstration projects. And again, without getting too far in the weeds, you're taking excess wind and solar or hi uh, hydro, think the spring, when we have a lot of it and we don't have a lot of energy needs, and you're basically capturing that, you're putting it, it through electrolysis process that allows you to either store it through our pipeline network or deliver it as fuel immediately through our pipeline network. And so we see a lot of potential here. Um, studies show you can blend between 10 and 15 percent hydrogen into the pipeline without any issues on in-use technology. A lot of research going on in Europe to figure out can you get to 20 percent. There's a second process that you could add to this where you, you take CO2 from the atmosphere and you add it to the hydrogen and you ba basically methanate it so you've then created an interchangeable product with natural gas. Why do I mention all this? It can get pretty complicated. I mention it to say there is a lot of innovation that is possible. Again, Northwest Natural has one of the newest, tightest pipeline networks in the country. Our customers have paid for it. It's sitting in the ground. Let's put it to use in new and innovative ways to help drive our emissions down collectively. And that's kind of our goal. So that leads me to carbon policy because there's a lot going on uh, in our region uh, and m many of you are probably as aware of it as I am. Um, one of the things that we hear often is this term deep decarbonization. And I don't know how many of you have heard that term, but it's very prevalent in sort of the, the stakeholder community around energy. And what does that mean? Well, deep decarbonization is looking at a 1990 emissions baseline, economy-wide, but sometimes just in the energy sector, and saying we have to get 80% below that baseline by 2050 in order to achieve our climate goals. That's what's called deep decarbonization. Now, you have to be able to do that while also factoring in population growth, economic growth. So it's a transformational kind of goal. It's going to mean changes throughout the economy, not just in the energy sectors. So we have, uh, uh, there have been a lot of studies that have come out nationwide, and there's been a couple of studies here in the region. Um, we actually engaged a, a consultant called, they're called E3. Um, they are a premier consultant who really started the work around deep decarbonization coming out of California. We engaged them because we wanted to take a very specific look at how do you achieve these economy-wide goals, both in Oregon and Washington, and do it in the most affordable, effective way using the gas system already in place, using an investment that we've already in, you know, invested in and will continue to invest in. And so they uh, basically they look at lots of different pathways, lots of different ways that you can do it. And the essential, I think, summary that they would say, and, and in this way they've agreed with the other two deep decarbonization studies that have come out of the Northwest, is it is going to be incredibly challenging to achieve this goal. It is, like I said, it's transforming the way our economy works, but it can be done. 
So that's the good news. It can be done. Um, and one of the key ingredients that all three deep decarbonization studies agree on is natural gas will be critical to achieving the goal out into 2050. Now, what our study really looked at was how do you serve buildings and homes? What's the fuel that's going to most likely serve homes and buildings to get to the goal most reliably and affordably? And we were really pleased to see that with a blend of 25% renewable natural gas through our pipeline system, we can achieve that 80% reduction goal in the economy and do it in the most affordable and we believe reliable way. And so I think at the end of the day, all of these studies are trying to help us envision a completely different future and begin us on the pathway to getting there. There's a very clear, I think, trajectory for the electric system. People get it, they, they kind of, you know, we, we have that frame of reference, which is great. And as I said, we have a very similar path that we can uh, forge on the gas system. And that's certainly what we're focused on. And that leads me probably to the last uh, uh, topic, which is cap and trade. Uh, and um, as, as hopefully everybody in the room knows, um, there has been a proposed bill uh, that has been released, uh, a cap and trade bill coming out called HB 2020. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of the politics, we feel like this bill uh, or some sort of program is going to be passed in this legislative session, that, that it's very likely that that's going to happen. We've been working with the stakeholders uh, for many months prior to the, to the first iteration of the bill coming out. And um, our uh, point of view is we can support a fair and effective cap and trade program. We're not opposed to it. But it has to be fair to our customers. And as I mentioned, our customers today are 5% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. The proposed bill that was released a couple of weeks ago uh, shows a double digit rate increase for our customers day one of the bill's uh, uh, effective date. And our point of view is that is not a fair and effective uh, piece of legislation. Uh, we have um, provided changes or, a, or an alternative proposal that basically looks at how California first did their bill and how they treated the gas utilities under that bill. Um, and we've mimicked that proposal and we think that's a more fair and effective way. It basically means in the first year, all of our customers would get, they call them customer allowances, but think of them as permits, basically for the first year that people don't have to pay in. Then for the year subsequent, um, there's a more gradual introduction to, to, to the cap that is um, parallel with the cap in the economy. So there's a more gradual impact on customer bills. There's still a, a price signal. There's still an impact. But it's just more gradual and we think more consistent and fair with the way California uh, did it. And why is this important? Well, you know, just as on the electric side, they're trying to decarbonize over time with more and more renewable energy, we want, we're want we focused on doing that on the gas side um, with renewable natural gas and hopefully eventually hydrogen. We want to give our company and our customers time to get there. And when you in integrate those kinds of resources into the gas system, you lower the compliance obligation that customers have to pay. So giving us time to do that with a, with a program that lessens that severity of the rate impacts is really what we're advocating for. Um, I would say uh, those discussions are ongoing. Um, we've communicated uh, the price impacts to the, to the stakeholders that we've been working with. We've gotten several media inquiries. We've communicated uh, the price impacts uh, to the media and to our business sales customers. For those customers on day one, it could be uh, a 28% price impact. And those customers obviously have, um, are very sensitive to changes in commodity costs. So um, we're right in the middle and staying engaged. We want to have a productive resolution. We think that we, you know, a bill can be passed that works, that gets to the goal, but also does it in a way that is more fair and consistent for our customers. So that's sort of uh, 
where I end and you ask me questions. I've covered a lot of ground. I hope I didn't get too technical or too down in the weeds, but I'm happy to take your questions. Cool. I guess um, I have the microphone. Um, so I, I do have quite a few questions. Um, Matt Miller with Gresham Sanitary. Hi. So we have 80% um, of our fleet on natural gas right now. Um, I guess my first question would be, what is, what is this going to do for our business? And is there um, maybe an ability for us to get some uh, offset um, or some money back after that, that increase? Right. Well, I can tell you one of the things that uh, we're advocating for is um, not only a, a less severe rate impact for customers, but also making sure the funds that are collected then can go back to our customers to reduce emissions through energy efficiency, through renewable natural gas purchases, for example. So because that over time lowers that cost ramp, right? We don't want that money to be spent on other things, and then we don't have any way to lower that emissions profile over time. So we are advocating for that. There's, as you can imagine, that's where the food fight happens. Everybody wants, you know, there's a lot of people that want uh, to leverage that money in various ways, but that's certainly what we're advocating for. I would say for your business specifically that um, you could call our major accounts folks and we could run some rate impact analysis for you if, if you have any questions. Um, I imagine that you're a sales customer uh, and if you didn't get our email, we did send an email to all sales customers so we'll make sure that you get that. But we're more than happy to run analysis for you and um, certainly talk about options. I think the other thing, you know, Renewable natural gas will lower that compliance obligation over time, and that's, again, the other uh, reason that we're so focused on it. So Cliff Hazen uh, is our major accounts rep, and you guys could. Hey Matt, I've been in a conversation with Larry with your, with your company, so. So I have the mic, so I guess I get to ask the next question. Um, I mean, what systems are in place to collect the um, gas from, I'm thinking of the dairy industry in yeah. Oregon, and so what systems are in place to collect the methane from uh, throughout the entire state from dairy uh, you know, cows? And then secondly, what systems do you have in place for collecting the food scraps yeah. and converting that to, to methane? Yeah. Well, you're asking the exact right question, and, and that's really the beginning of the tra trajectory of taking all of these waste streams and creating viable fuel source. It's not a technology around the conversion of it. It's more how do we efficiently gather these feedstocks and get them into the system. What's happening in dairies now is they're using it for electric generation primarily, and that's changing, and the reason it's changing is that there are very lucrative incentives coming out of California in the transport, from the transportation sector. So they not only have state incentives here in Oregon, they've got really lucrative incentives in California and federal incentives. So what's happening is it's driving more and more interest farmers and others, you know, food scraps, wastewater treatment plants, to look at vehicle fueling stations and to look at collection opportunities that they, they can then turn those into, basically put that in the pipeline into vehicles. And so we're starting to see a lot of that. In California, they had recently passed a number of bills very specific to um, farms and ag uh, to try and incent more pipeline uh, development out to sort of an aggregated point so they collect all of the manure from all of the farms and they've extended a pipeline to gather it and bring it into the system. Um, that's something that we, we would obviously look at and we have a proposal, there's proposed legislation right now that will allow us um, as a state to more aggressively develop renewable natural gas and to allow it in, uh, to serve our homes and businesses. Think about how the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, helped sort of spur this on the electric side. That's kind of what this voluntary bill would do on the gas side. So there are, that is the exact question we need to ask, right, and answer, which is how do we aggregate all of these feedstocks and then get them into the pipeline network? Um, but I can tell you that 
I think more than 60% of all the heavy duty vehicles in California run on renewable natural gas. And as you know, that's, I don't know, is it, is it the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world? So when you put your shoulder to it, you can figure it out. Um, and, and that's the work that we're starting to, to to engage with now, and I think we've been really pleased with the level of interest, uh, both in terms of our customers. We've surveyed our customers. You can imagine there's more than 80% uh, uh, really favor going after this new fuel source, but also stakeholders. There's a lot of interest in, in of course, solving this local, local waste problem, too. So do you need legislation to help you achieve your goals? Is there some legislation that you would like to see on the books that might help make this happen? Yes, actually the, the renewable natural gas legislation that's currently being proposed, we've been working hard on that with, with various stakeholders and legislators. And the answer is yes, because just if you think about um, the, the regulatory construct, we're not allowed to go after some of these um, new energy sources because when you first, just think about when we first started purchasing wind and solar energy, it was more expensive than conventional uh, electricity um, produced through fossil. So there is going to be a curve, right? We're going to need to start and then drive those cost curves down. So our point of view is let's start integrating that in now. Let's get the market going. Let's let California pay for some of this uh, market development. And let's get it into the pipeline soon. Uh, and that will help lower the cost curve over time. So yes, we, need, we believe we do need some legislative support to get this market going. Again, just like if you think about wind and solar energy, it's very similar. So, and we're hopeful. You know, we're hopeful we're going to see that uh, and be, uh, w well, in some ways we'd be the first state to do it. In the way that we're envisioning it, we would be the first state to do it. And we think that's the right time to, to be putting that stake in the ground. So, Questions? This is uh, great information you put forth, you know, especially converting some of our diesel vehicles to the CNG, you know, as the sanitary. Great for short range kind of things. And I was, um, I was wondering, you know, we might have some low hanging fruit, say with the school buses, they have hundreds of thousands of those every day on short range trips. Would yeah. there be an opportunity to do a conversion and have um, less toxic emissions around our kids? I think it's a really good question, and we have a team of folks uh, that are looking at those opportunities. Um, and you know, different districts have different sort of frame of mind of what kind of mix they're looking at, but uh, that is definitely something that we're pursuing. We think there's a lot of good information coming out of Los Angeles and some other markets that show the real value of compressed natural gas uh, for school buses, um, and also potentially the ability to integrate renewable natural gas. Uh, again, not just a, a large carbon benefit, but a big air quality benefit, and really great performance. You don't have to worry about hills or, you know, so there's great opportunities. We're working on it. I think there's challenges, just like on the EV side. You've got the chicken and the egg. You need to have the fueling infrastructure in order to facilitate the uh, passenger vehicle growth. And, and I think they're doing a great job of trying to grapple with that and solve that. We need to do that with return to base fleets, and we're working on that too. So good question. More questions. Ask for more questions. OK, we got one more. First, thanks for coming today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of an offshoot, shoot, but we're all consumers, and so we all have a lot of waste. <laughs> so uh, education programs, uh, and uh, you mentioned you know, our waste stream and, and turning it back into fuel. Uh, our recyclability and our uh, ways of doing that is, are you approaching that at all? Uh, as far as how how our consumers can help uh, get us there as well. Yeah. Well, I would say, I mean, we, I think as a state, we have a built-in advantage because we have a much more educated uh, sort of electorate on these kinds of sustainability issues. We've got a real strong ethos around it, around recycling and thinking about uh, our the way we consume things and waste. So I think 
fundamentally we have an advantage and it's really sort of channeling that advantage. There are, um, there are movements to how do we take the food waste, for example, and, and use it and leverage it for renewable natural gas. It certainly helps, again, to have all of these financial incentives coming out of other markets to help facilitate the investments that are required to do that. So I think we're going to see a lot more uh, progress. Um, again, we've been amazed just in the year and a half, two years, that we've really been talking about uh, this vision, um, how much progress to have you know, three projects by 2020 online in Oregon um, with that kind of volume is really progress. But we've also been trying to do our own education around this because when you say renewable natural gas, there's no awareness of it. And it isn't, unfortunately or fortunately, it's not as um, maybe as easy as an iconic windmill or solar panel shot. Like you have to do some educating and explanation. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think um, we've done some focus groups to try and figure out what's the best way to communicate on this. We're, we're zeroing in on that, and I think we do have an understanding of what needs to, to get done in terms of that communication. But it, it will be an ongoing effort, um, uh, but one that uh, really I do believe represents a great opportunity because there's also, frankly, a resiliency benefit to having a local energy source right here in our backyard. Uh, and that's, that's another benefit. We don't have to pay for pipeline transportation fees if we have a, a source of energy right here. That's another sort of offsetting, cost offsetting benefit. So there are other, other benefits to having this locally sourced. And I think people get that. We all have that, we want to buy local. And this sort of infuses that, I think, that benefit a little bit too. So more must be done though. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'll ask another question. Um, so we have seen over the years when we, when we purchase a, a natural gas truck, um, mm -hmm. we've seen that margin or that premium uh, increase. So like a, a, if I went out and got a quote for a diesel truck, be like $320,000. If I go and buy a natural gas truck, it's like 370,000. Yeah. So it used to be like 20, $30,000 difference where that ROI um, based upon the fuel savings was much quicker yeah. and much more lucrative in, that, in, in purchasing those vehicles. What it feels like I'm seeing, and maybe you can kind of give me some feedback on that, but that, that, that ROI is now becoming much long, you know, longer period of time. Mm. Um, and then now if we're saying that the fueling is now getting more expensive, along with the, the vehicles themselves are getting uh, more of a, uh, a premium for those vehicles, um, I don't know, but I mean, just, yeah. just what I'm seeing, what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I, to be honest with you, I'm not, I don't have, you know, we have experts on, on this topic which we should connect you with. I, wouldn't it surprise me to learn that that premium is there? I think we have California to probably thank for it because there is a very high demand on those kinds of vehicles because of air quality benefits, not just in California, but in other markets that have air quality challenges. These zero, uh, these um, uh, Cummings Westport in particular, this kind of engine, it's a game changer and so everybody's putting them in so that they can uh, meet their air quality uh, uh, emissions targets. So I'm, I, for that reason, I'm not surprised we might be seeing a little bit of a premium on the vehicles themselves. But in terms of the operating costs relative to, to compressed natural gas and RNG compared to diesel, I mean, my understanding is if the Oregon legislation gets passed, that will apply to diesel and gasoline. Um, but again, I'm no expert, and I would say that bill is moving. So, uh, you know, um, it would surprise me greatly if uh, a bill was constructed that made folks pay for compressed natural gas emissions but not for diesel or gasoline, I don't know why that would make sense. But um, so I think, you know, theoretically, every source of emission in transportation would have to carry its own weight. And you will actually be in an advantage if you have a lower emitting source of fuel because your compliance costs should be lower. Now, I say should because this bill is moving and there are a lot of you know things going on. And so we're going to watch it really carefully. And we're going to be communicating to customers as these as 
I think the bill progresses on what the implications are. But I would definitely say um, getting you two together with our with our folks. Um, we have a, a really bright guy that's leading our NGV area. And there are also maybe federal or state grants for vehicles that we could put you in touch with potentially too. So Cliff, anything to add on that? Because Cliff's also yeah, in our major account. So um, I'm assuming that renewable natural gas and compressed natural gas on an incremental per unit cost basis is higher than what we currently are paying for what's in the pipeline. Yeah. So when that's brought on board in 2020 and part of that goes into the pipeline, what's the adjustment in our, our rates? Yeah. Well, it's really going to depend on what, uh, you know, because we're going to be competing for that source, and that's why we want to try and have legislation that allows us to develop it here locally. Um, what I would say is the, the proposal that we're making under the legislation, very much like the electric uh, RPS, is that there are caps on the amount of rate adjustment and so it really caps you on the amount of renewable natural gas you can buy so that you don't have any kind of rate shock associated with that new supply. Um, but the way it should work, now I don't know if this is the way it will work, but the way we would advocate it working is have a cap and trade program that allows you to um, get the benefit of that carbon reduction from renewable natural gas so that if you have a compliance obligation here and you're putting in a lower emitting fuel source that you're getting the benefit of that. Just like, I mean, I think that's the, the idea on the electric side, right? You're, you're putting in wind and solar energy, give us time to do that, don't charge our customers because we have to make these investments in wind and solar energy. We're trying to say, you know, we're under this cap and trade program, we want to pay our fair share, let's take the money that's collected and then in, let's reinvest it in ways that lower emissions over time permanently, like energy efficiency or a renewable fuel supply. So it's sort of that we're trying to find ways over the long term to drive that compliance cost down. And again, a lot of moving parts, but that's our idea. We would never want our customers to pay twice for emissions reductions. And I think, I think the electrics have made that argument very effectively. You, you want to pay for emissions, but do it in a fair way. And you want to you wanna have a trajectory that's driving that compliance cost down over time. Otherwise, you're not really creating systemic solutions. And you're not going to meet the G GHG goals. So. But, I mean, if your question is, is renewable natural gas more expensive than conventional natural gas? Yes. Just as wind and solar energy, when they first were developed, are more expensive than conventional electric generation? Yes. And so our job is to figure out how do you get that market going in the most cost-effective way? How do you start integrating that in, get some scale, and then drive that cost down over time? That's our goal. Is there a last question? Good questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. When I was in Roatan, not to belabor the point that I was on vacation for three weeks, um, that for the four, for the fourth year in a row, there was a couple, Max and Deb, that visited Roatan at the same time we were there, and they're from Iowa. <clears throat> so when I read your read your bio and I saw that you were from Iowa, now I know three people from Iowa, um, and I looked it up to see, you know, what about the Hawkeyes? How can we make the introduction flavorful? Well, Iowa Buckeyes beat. Oregon State in 1956 in the Rose Bowl. So you're one of many people that have beat Oregon State. Um, I'm a Beaver fan, so that I'm saying that lovingly. So anyway, thank you very much. And the reason I bring that up is that Max says, well, Lynn, when are you and, and Drake going to come to Iowa to visit? And I said, not going to happen. I mean, what's in Iowa, you know? Really? 
There you go. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a good school. Thank you for that information. Um, when I was in the legislature, and we had two, we had a brother and a sister arguing over something, banks and credit unions, utilities, whatever. I said, go in a room, close the door, figure it out, and come let me know when you figure it out. And this is one of those cases where it's a big complicated issue and when it looks like brother and sister are arguing over something, there's got to be a happy medium someplace because we're the ones, the, the customers or the parents are the ones that are going to suffer if it doesn't all work out. <clears throat> Sometimes from a political perspective, it's wise to keep brother and sister arguing so that other things can happen and they can start negotiating through. So politics are involved. We all want to save the environment. I'm, I'm picturing cows backing up to little poop machines and they flush it through and they do all this kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> to capture the gas. And then what animal is next that we're going to start making little poop machines from and, you know, get it in the pipeline. So there you go. And that's going to be on the cable news forever. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, I was hoping it was over the hour. So I want to thank you all again for attending today. Portland General Electric, Dean Funk, thank you very much. And he is a board member. Thank you very much for a presenting sponsor. And Robin Judge Little from Columbia Bank, thanks for making it today as well. Uh, Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media, Keith, thanks for doing such a great job. We are honored to have Mayor Shane Bemis as our guest speaker in March. <clears throat> we need to, you need to put March 19th on your calendar. Reserve your space early. It will be a sold out event. It's going to be here in this room. It's going to be an interview process. The mayor is actually going to let me ask him questions and he's actually going to answer them. So be sure and hold your seat early for that and pick up a replay schedule from Metro East. Nina, I want to um, just give you a shout out. Nina came to me six, eight months ago and she says, we should have someone from my company come up here and, and talk. And you were persistent and you did a great job and you provided us with wonderful information today. So congratulations on your tenacity. She's, she's one of those people that works for a big company that has a plethora of chambers. She's got to... Um, covet, you know, take care of, and we're one of them, so thank you for making us feel special. I appreciate today. So, without any further ado, you're dismissed. Thanks for being here.